The next session is not the next session that you had on the program. We're going to do one quick switch, so I hope that's going to be okay for everybody, and thank you for accommodating this, Andrew. I am very excited to um, announce this next session, though. It's going to take place in two parts. We're going to have a keynote, and then afterwards, we're going to have a panel discussion. And I would now like to introduce the keynote speaker. We're incredibly excited and really honored as a community to have Cory Doctorow as part of our program. He is one of my favorite science fiction authors. He's an activist and a journalist. I have to absolutely recommend his latest book, Choke Point Capitalism, which he wrote together with Rebecca Giblin. It's a non-fiction book about how capitalism has taken over our creative labor markets and has a lot of recommendations that really relate also to what we're working on in the open tech context. So Corey is also a digital rights activist and expert working for the Electronic Foundation and an MIT Media Lab research affiliate. Um, he's a core spokesperson for things around open tech and right to repair, and that's what he'll be speaking about for us today. Over to you, Corey. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Yeah, can you hear me though? Yeah. Not if you can hear. <laughs> yeah, do you hear? People okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try restarting the video. One second here. Hmm. Well, that's not good. Um, hang on. I will try the internal video on my laptop instead. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, still getting a black screen, huh? Hmm. Okay, let me uh, log back out and log back in. I'll be right back. Okay, see you in a sec, Corey. Thank you. I'll use this opportunity to do a tiny bit of housekeeping and let you know some of the things that we brought to a show and tell, um, not just on stage, but off stage, uh, to represent who we are as a community. So we have a wonderful poster exhibition where some of you will find yourselves on these posters. Um, and you can see this exhibition in the foyer here. This uh, was a project we did together with the Nord Zubrücken Foundation to just show, yeah, what are the, some of the great stuff that you guys are working on across the world. So you can see this poster exhibition. We have also brought a lot of flyers from the different projects that we're running, from the Make Project, from Critical Making, um, Carables and Co-Act. There's posters and flyers, so you can inform yourself a bit more of those projects that Sandra mentioned earlier. And we made new stickers. So please help yourselves to lots of gig stickers. And now we see you, Corey. Fantastic. So um, that was my tiny little bit of housekeeping in the meanwhile. One other thing that's important that I want to point out is that we have a tiny open hardware exhibition, but one that you should definitely see. And this is a little foreshadowing also of the open hardware exhibition that we will have at Republica this year. So a big thank you for the exhibitors and for being a part of this as well. It's getting better. <laughs> well, I, I figured it out. It turns out that uh, Blur My Background is uh, now synonymous in Zoomland for show no picture at all. Uh, so you get to see the very daggy London hotel room I'm staying in. I hope it doesn't offend you over much. Um, thank you very much for, for having me today. I, I really am honored by the chance to talk to you. Obviously, right to repair is an issue that's very close to my heart. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do today in these few moments that we have before you start your conference is try and broaden the frame a little. Uh, one of the uh, great heroes of the digital rights movement is the scholar James Boyle. He's a Scotsman who lives in uh, North Carolina, where he and Jennifer Jenkins run the Duke Center for the Public Domain. And Jamie, uh, he tells this little parable. He says that before the term ecology was coined, there were a lot of issues, but no movement. Uh, you know, maybe you cared about owls and I cared about the ozone layer, but like, what does the destiny of charismatic nocturnal avians really have to do with the gaseous composition of the upper atmosphere? How can, how can we really relate these two phenomena? And Jamie says, look, the term ecology turns all these different issues 
into one big movement. It says, in fact, they are all different facets of this big fight that we're all having together. And it makes the movement something to be reckoned with because on our own, we are uh, incapable of mustering enough public sentiment, enough political will, enough of a tailwind to actually make a difference. But together, uh, we can get stuff done. So I wanna talk to you about what repair actually is when it's at home. Um, obviously, it's part of uh, the uh, ecology movement. Obviously, it's part of the environment movement. No one is uh, benefited by the you know, uh, increasing uh, toll of plastics, conflict metals, and so on that, that show up in our landfills and elsewhere because of the um, uh, because uh, manufacturers very cynically design their devices not to gracefully uh, uh, degrade back into the material stream and, and indeed to frustrate efforts to repair them so that they can be uh, um, uh, replaced by new goods that the manufacturer can get another paycheck for. Uh, but I, I think that um, more importantly, we need to understand right to repair as part of the wider project of technological self-determination that ultimately um, the people who design our devices are often uh, not very good at anticipating our needs. They are often very different from the people who end up using the devices and technologies. Um, you know, most obviously and visibly, we have this idea that um, a technology should be so easy that your mother can use it, this, this uh, awful sexist thing that people say. And the reality is, that until recently, and still not to the extent that it should be, um, uh, women are absent from the design process for technology. And, and more importantly, um, the kinds of women who are raising children are, are really absent from the technology design process, which means that in order to be a mother who uses technology, you have to reverse engineer the weird ideas, the people who uh, unknowing and arrogantly decided how you should use technology, decided they understood better than you do how your life should work. You know, uh, this is in contrast to say your boss, uh, when your boss uh, is in the um, breakfast room at the Comfort Inn trying to download their slides for the presentation they're doing later, they get to call up the head of network administration or the CISO and say, I don't care about the uh, security risks that you're worried about. Um, I, as soon as this kid in the Comfort Inn is done playing, uh, you know, Roblox on the shared iMac in the lobby here, I'm going to sit down to it and I want to be inside the firewall downloading those slides uh, and you make it happen or someone else is going to do your job. The people who have the uh, easiest time using technology is your boss. The hardest time is your mom, people in the global south, poor people, kids, people who are just not in the room when we design these technologies. Now, these people are by no means incapable of making a contribution to technology design. And in fact, they routinely do. Uh, if you know the history of computers, you know that women were key to its history. Obviously, we've all heard about how kids can adapt technology for their own needs. Um, everywhere you go in the global south, you find words like bricolage or jugad or um, uh, you know other equivalents to mend and make do in which people in the global south are adapting technology to their own needs. And in so doing, they're not just correcting the errors that the designers of technology made, they are asserting the right to have a say in how the technology that they use works. They're asserting the right to have technology serve them instead of having to torque themselves around to serve the technology, to serve the ignorance of its designers, to serve the greed of the shareholders of the firm that made it, to seize the means of computation. And repair is just a piece of this. And it's not surprising that uh, some of our most stalwart defenders and the right to repair are farmers. Um, every farmstead going back to Roman times had a forge. Um, and there's a good reason for that. When you're at the end of a lonely country road and the storm is coming uh, and you need to bring the crops in, you don't have time for a John Deere to dispatch a technician who takes 36 hours to arrive and charges you $200 to look at the repair you made yourself and type the unlock code that activates the part that you installed and get it running. Um, and so farmers, like other kinds of people who exist in extremis, have always needed to be able to seize the means of computation, to redesign the technology that they use, to improve it. And indeed, 
until John Deere took its recent turn for uh, the greedy and monopolistic, its innovation consisted primarily of sending field engineers out to talk to farmers about how they'd modified their tractors so that those modifications could be integrated into subsequent editions of John Deere's own products. Repair, innovation, adaptation, and the dignity of being able to decide how the technology that you rely on works, these are all inseparable phenomena. They are all uh, intimately related. And moreover, the legal barriers to repair are also the legal barriers to all other forms of adaptation. The anti-circumvention laws that make it illegal to build a diagnostic tool that can interpret the messages, the error messages traveling around within a device that's stopped working, whether that's a vehicle or an iPhone. Those anti-circumvention laws are the same ones that stop you from installing a third-party uh, app store. They're the same ones that stop you from adapting your continuous glucose monitor and your insulin pump so that you can build what uh, people with diabetes call the closed loop where uh, a little bit of uh, machine logic mediates between the monitor and the pump to try and establish a, a homeostasis of your blood sugar uh, to keep you well. And, and, and even more importantly, this is often used by the parents of young children with type 1 diabetes to make sure that they're kept well at an age in which they are too young to uh, uh, manage their own diabetes themselves. All of these fights are the same fight. The owls in the ozone layer the farmer who wants to repair their tractor and the farmer who wants to modify their tractor, the person who wants to install their own app store and the person who wants to um, repair their iPhone, they are fighting the same rules for the same reason. And uh, although repair has been a charismatic thin edge of the wedge for the wider project of technological self-determination, if we are going to make repair the reality that it needs to be, and if it's going to have the impact that we need it to have on the environment, then I think we need to um, uh, understand that we are part of a wider movement, a kind of ecology movement for technology, the movement for technological self-determination, the movement to seize the means of computation. And so as someone who's been in that movement for a couple of decades, I salute you. And uh, I offer you the solidarity of all of us who've worked on this for so long and who will work on it for the years to come. Thank you.